Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Sean T, and today we're going to enhance your ability to trust and believe that when you hit rock bottom, it's actually a strong foundation. A lot of people give up, and today I have an incredible guest. I'm so excited that he's here, Peter Meyerhoff. I'm going to let him tell most of the story, but when I tell you right now, if you've ever been in a situation where you really feel like or felt like you couldn't dig deep to get out of it, today is going to be the day to help take you there. We're going to talk about mental health. We're going to talk about struggle. We're going to talk about fear, especially as being men when sometimes we're not allowed to talk about fear. We're going to talk about a lot. So get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say, oh yeah. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Peter, welcome to the show. I gave you a hug already. I would literally hug you on camera because I'm so excited that you're here. I'm just going to jump right in. You have your own podcast, so you know how to tell a story. Give me the foundation of who you are, and we're going to go from there. All right. So I'll I'll give the two minute crash course of my life. You know, I had a great family growing up, you know, both parents, my parents divorced when I I was about 10 years old, but it didn't affect me. You know, they were, they were still both around one of the top athletes. I was in a movie as a kid. I had a modeling agent, like I had it all as a kid. And when I went to high school, my life got flipped upside down freshman year high school. I had a fake sexual assault that happened and completely ruined my life at that point, what I thought. And I wasn't even driving at this time. I was 15 years old and the story comes full circle because what I went to prison for is, was my best friend during this time. So, Mm. um, we were, you know, drinking at my mom's house, like we always do. And I have, we have, um, a couple women over 15 years old. Keep in mind, we're not even driving at this time. So it was, it was me and my friend, Brandon and two, two females, Ashley and Lindsay and her older brother supplied us with a bottle of Jack Daniels drop them off they like kids like sneaking out of the bedroom window he drops them off at the house yeah i lose my virginity that friday night we drink half the bottle of jack daniels we do the exact same thing saturday night to this day i don't know i i still think she had to have got caught like sneaking in her bedroom and said some stuff and like didn't realize like what she had said and it just turned too big too quick but somehow the next day that they were saying that i had sex while she was sleeping i technically raped this chick and i was like what the heck are you talking about and nobody had my back so I went and I went to school and I had to like literally drop out of school like that afternoon. They were they were getting so many messages like at, with the principal's office and stuff that like I wasn't even safe to be at school anymore. So they like in the middle of the day came and had the police officers come and get me and like pretty much walked me off campus and told me I wasn't safe to be here anymore. So I went from being like the most popular kid and thought I was going to go pro at whatever sport I wanted to honestly and to dropping out of school at 15 years old. And that's when I get involved in drugs. Before we step into that, there was something really powerful you said that I think people deal with on a daily basis. I know especially a lot of people who are, you know, in my fit fam or my communities, they always feel like they're alone. Yeah. And when people feel like they're alone, many different things happen. They could lash out. They can obviously go deeper into being alone. But, you know, when you said no one had your back, like talk about what that felt like, because I feel like that could be a foundation to a lot of things. Suicide was on my mind, you know, like when you, when you feel like no one got your back and you're just alone. I mean, there's, I mean, it's honestly, you feel like there's nothing to live for. That's how I felt. I didn't want to live anymore. To be honest, at 15 years old, I thought, I wish my life was over, you know, and it was like overnight, my life changed, like to where I had like millions and millions of possibilities, you know, like what colleges I wanted to go play, what sport I even wanted to go to college in, you know, and it's like overnight, I'm like not even in school anymore. Now I'm hanging out with dudes that do drugs, you know, and I'm, I turned into drugs like overnight too. Cause I'm, that's what these kids do. I'm from Ahwatukee. So like I went from like being the popular kid. So now I got to hang out with these other dudes that I'd known, but I didn't associate with them cause I was, a, I was an athlete, you know, but I hang out with them and they do drugs and I don't, I'm alone. I have nothing to behave for, nothing going in my, in my life anymore. So I turned to drugs and did drugs for two or three years. And it just, I mean, it, to say it took me down a bad path is a complete understatement. You know, it gets you into stealing cars, burglarizing houses, like the worst of the worst, but like when I finally went to prison, I, I mean, I didn't even care. I didn't have a life to live for anyways. You know, like I thought my life was over 15 to 18 years old. You know, I'm from the hood. So <laughs> I know. You made it out the hood. Then I congrats. made it out the hood. 
I'm still kind of hood on the low, <laughs> but in the hood and like even today, like people use the term, but we call it ride or die. Like who are your ride or dies? And so you, you know, a lot of times people are growing up and they have these people and it's like, oh, you're like, you're my best friend, you know, like all these people that kind of have your back and then something happens and then people fall to the wayside because they don't want to be associated with the challenge. Mm -hmm. Is it really innocent until proven guilty? Because, you know, when something happens, people kind of protect themselves instead of saying, you know, like I am a ride or die person. I'm like, well, we're going to figure this out, yeah. you know, and I'm going to be with you to the end until we figure it out. And if you did happen to do something that was crazy, you know, I can handle that with you. But for now, like, let's work it, work through it. So I know there was a transition of you going from being alone to hanging out with people who did drugs. What was the transition of that, though? I kind of want people to understand, you know, the scale or the slide of how you actually get to that point. Yeah, and mine had happened so quick, which is why, like, my biggest passion, I was working with kids because, like, I got introduced to, no joke, Keep in mind, I'm an athlete, never touched drugs. I smoke weed and that was it. And I get introduced to crack cocaine, ecstasy, cocaine, crystal meth, all the same weekend. And they, they introduced crystal meth to me and said like, oh, don't even worry, it's a fun party drug. You'll love it, just try it. And I'm like, okay, why, you know, why not? You know? And uh, I tried, I didn't get off meth until I was in rehab nine months later. You know, I was in, I was in full on inpatient rehab at 15 years old, you know, nine months later. Yeah. Real quick, one thing I do want to say is, you want to learn about who your ride or dies are, go to prison. You know what I'm saying? And like when I called you this morning, my mom is my ride or die now. You know what I'm saying? I like try to ride everywhere with my mom. You know, I spent so many years away from her and so many years in a cell like away from my family. And she couldn't believe when I met her that I was, she's like, you're, she tell her daughter all the time, like, he always wants to hang out with me. So I'm like, I, I love moms. You know, I just lo I love being happy. Love I'm, I'm over that tough guy stuff that all these people on the streets have that image of that stuff. And I mean, that's who I like to surround myself with now, you know? Yeah. Just so y'all know. We, we have a studio audience, which is cool. And the studio <laughs> audience happens to be his ride or dies, which I think is the most amazing. He did call me up this morning. He was like, yo, you know, my mom wants to come. My brother's <laughs> mom wants to come. I'm like, let's have a party. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm here for it. But honestly, that phone call, in retrospect, I think about it, and I'm like, wow. Like, that is a support system. Because a lot of times, you know, and, and throwing back to what happened to you, a lot of times we do show up and have to go places on our own. And so even though we'll get to the prison sentence in that experience, it's still like however many years later, plus the prison sentence, and you still have those people that have your back, which was going to be my next question. When you started going through that challenge, how did it affect your family? I used drugs to numb, numb what it did. You know, I, to be honest, I've never asked my mom how bad it affected them for like those 15, 18 year, years old when I was, you know, out in, the, out in the streets just doing crime and doing drugs. I just know how brutal the prison part was with her, you know, and, um, and I've said forever, like for the rest of my life, I'm just gonna be trying to write all those wrongs I did when I was a kid, you know, especially my mom. And like, there's nothing greater than making your mom proud still. I'm 37 years old, you know, and I still want to make my mom proud, you know? Yeah. I want to commend you on being a mama's boy oh, yeah. and I can feel it in your I knew voice. I was going to cry to you. got me twice already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you know, it's real. We're the po this podcast is about truth, trust, and transparency. Yeah. We have a platform and we talk so that I say in my book, everybody's in a closet about something. For you sure. know, when people see you, when I first started following you, I'm like, wow, this guy is cool. You know, he's confident, but I know from my experience, how people think I am, like everybody's in a closet about something. They also probably look at you like you know he's big he's you know if they ever watch any of your videos they're like oh my gosh he's so powerful but i know for a fact that the transparency comes from a deep place so cry as much as you want on here <laughs> there you go i've cried plenty of times yeah. and i don't even care the same diving into the family more and there are people who are listening who are either on that side where you were where you were the one having and like funnel to make these choices because of struggle and then there might be someone that's on your family side meaning it could be you know your parents talk about how the turmoil affected them and like what kind of communication needed to be had to kind of work through that wow that's a that's a really deep good question and you know to be honest i don't i don't even know you know i know it ruined i mean i i still have a hard time i ruined my little brother's life you know like he was a I was really good at baseball and he was, he played on my teams and he was two years younger than me, you know, like he would throw dudes out from his knees at, at catcher and he didn't finish school, you know, when I got out, you know, like, so to say that it 
it didn't just ruin my life. You know, I felt like I ruined my little brother's life. You know, I still, that's one of the things I still have a hard time with, you know, wow, you asked some good questions, bro. You're getting me to cry three times already. <laughs> when people know who you are, yeah. they believe who you are. Yeah. And so I'm somewhat of an empath. Like when our communication, mostly I'm through Instagram and like a couple of texts when you had COVID, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I felt you in a different way. I didn't feel like I was just talking to like, oh, this guy that lives like 25 minutes away yeah. somewhere, you know, I'm like, no, I feel you. Like, sure. I feel you. And seeing people on your show, people that I know on your show, like your ability to allow them to be transparent. I'm like, there has to be something about you that feels that you can express the same way. So I'm not here to make you cry. No, yeah. But I want to feel you in the most and I've always way. And I've always just been myself. And that's what that's what kind of ended up helping me to, to run and fast forward a little bit, to run in like prison yards. was like, I never fit the mold. You know what I'm saying? I always kind of did my own thing. And I was like, one one thing you learn in prison is like if, when you're tough, you can do a lot of stuff, you know. So I just I I was a I was a tough bad dude in there, and I didn't listen to that stuff. And I had, you, you know, you're not even allowed to watch BET music in there, you know. Like you're not allowed to watch BET on your TV, no rap music, none of that stuff, you know. Nothing I'm, that can <clears throat> influence you. Yeah, yeah. But and, let's talk about that before we before we get there. All right, so let's talk about the process of you going to prison, right? Like how what was the process? I mean, obviously there was either a trial. I ended up burglarizing the house. I got 12 years in prison for one burglary charge, a non-dangerous burglary charge. And it was my old best friend who was with me that night. And of course, didn't stand up for me, didn't say anything. All he And if he says one thing, like he knew what happened, like that whole thing goes away. But of course, kids are so easily influenced. He's like, oh, I'm not getting involved in that stuff. I'm like, what do you mean you're not getting involved in this stuff? Like, you knew what happened. I'm your best friend. And he's like, I'm, I'm not getting involved in this. And like literally hung up on me. So I was like, wow, what yeah. is going on? So to say, going back to the being alone thing, so spring break, which should have been my senior high school, my little brother and his friends all come and tell me that they had just burglarized the Nelson's house. And that's Brandon Nelson was my friend. And we're like, no way. They were in Hawaii for spring break. I literally took a snowboard, a drill, some Jordan basketball shorts and Jordan sandals. And my two friends that I went with had taken the jewelry upstairs. I never even made it out of the garage. I plan on literally taking just dumb stuff that would annoy him when he went to look for it to come find it. But they wouldn't say their house got robbed, you know? Right, right. My friends come running down, say they got the jewelry and everything. We all smash out of the house. And of course, what happens? My loyal ride or die friends, when the cops come ask us all, my buddy that stole the jewelry said that I had taken the jewelry, said that he was sleeping at my mom's house and I came back and told him I'd done it. I was like this little tough kid now. So I'm like, I'm not saying nothing to the police. So they just threw the book at me and gave me 12 years in prison for a non-dangerous burglary charge at 18 years of age. So I sat in the county jail for almost 19 or 20 months sitting in there and and I did not look like this. You know, I got locked up. I was six foot 144 pounds. By the time I went to prison, I think I was probably 160 pounds, you know, like long blonde hair, you know, like <laughs> definitely not the prison type, you know. <clears throat> and every single person there is straight gangbangers. Like every single person there is full on gang members, you know. And I'm like, what the heck did I do to get myself put in here, you know. And yeah. that's when I gave up on God. You know, I was like, there's no way God would give me 12 years in prison for this crime. You know what I mean? And to be someone I wasn't, you know, I, it turned me into a violent, angry person there, you know, but it's like, you, you got to do what you got to do in there, you know, so I put that facade on and put all that stuff on and put the image because luckily I used to box and then I just shut it all off when I got out. I did watch, you know, a few videos of yours and you talk about how you <clears throat> didn't look like this because I mean, not that I want you to go back to prison, but if you walked in prison looking like that, it'd probably be a different story. <laughs> but knowing that you walked in prison being skinny, young, probably extremely afraid I want you to tell them about that first day you walked in there and like the things you had to do yeah. to just in a way, keep yourself safe for an extended period of time. To be honest, I didn't even know anything until after a few days and I was there and, I, and like, no one like gave me any like rap or conversation, nothing. I'm like, I'm a real good, like people reader. And like, I can, I can, I can feel vibes places, you know, like I feel like that's one of my good uh, character traits that I have right now. And I could just tell. So I ended up, I remember up hitting up one of the dudes and coming to find out, but they thought I was a gay because I was like such a little pretty boy. You know, I had long blonde hair. And you know what I mean? Like they tell me that and I was like, I'm like, all right. He's so like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> let's let's like, don't try me like that. Who am I scrapping now? You know? And but that's what I did. So then I end up they tell me like just to make an example out of somebody. So I end up beating up the dude that ran my building who was twice my size. And it's not funny story, but they, you know, they when you go to prison, this is the guy that schools me, you know? And have you ever heard the story? Like, do you know why they called a sucker punch? Uh, kind of, but you can tell. Well, they say, because you're the sucker if you get punched. Exactly. And I was like, I was like, okay, what does that mean? He goes, if you even think you're going to get into it with somebody, you just take off on them. 
And I was like, geez, we can do that in here? And he's like, yeah, this is prison. I was like, all right. So coming full circle, this is the dude that didn't like me, you know? And he's the guy I made an example out of. And he went to Dill, turn his back on me. And he's like, I'm going to, goes to take the chew out of his mouth. He's like, I'll teach you a little young punk how to respect your elders, something like that. And I was on top of him, like beat the brakes off this dude. And then like the next, the next day we come out to chow. And now like I was this dude that nobody knew. No one gave me a conversation to. He did not even say hi to. The next morning I got to chow. And now all these OGs on the yard are, yo, youngster, I heard what you did, blah, blah, blah. So-and-so is my name. So-and-so is my name. And then they're like, hey, youngster, dude running the yard wants to talk to you. I'm just like. But when you're a easy, like a young kid, that's really easily impressionable, especially when you're like used to being the alpha male. You know what I'm saying? Like I knew everybody everywhere I went. I was the most popular kid, you know, even in counties, I was 18 years old, 19 years old running stuff in there, you know, and it's an addictive feeling. So then I was like, OK, this is all I got to do now is beat people up in here. You know, so thank God I used to box. And the dude running the yard asked me if I want to like put in work and get on the program. I was like, what does that even mean, sir? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what you mean. And he tells me like doing bad things to bad people though. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I, I, I literally don't care. I'll, I'll do whatever, you know? And you know, I mean, it's, you start putting in work and it just, I mean, it changed your whole career path in there, you know, it's like, but it's like that you have no chance once you sign up for that stuff, like you don't get to say no, you know? So for the full 12 years, I signed up on that mission and, you know, I got out of a lot of people don't know this, you know, my, I got out of my last uh, 10 months in solitary confinement for under investigation for another attempt to murder in there, you know? Again, there could be people listening and hearing that and being like, oh my gosh, one, it was in his past, yep. obviously. Two, prison culture is a completely different culture. You know, I've had, I know family members that have gotten 10 years. Mm -hmm. The point I'm trying to make is the stories that I hear when people were in prison and the things that they had to do to the outside world sounds like, oh my gosh, like why would you get involved in that? It's like what it seems like from the outside is just like survival of the fittest. Like it's, you have to it's not only survival of the fittest, it for sure is, but it's like on top of that, like I didn't even know what the real world was like. You know, like I was a little kid and I got locked up living at my mom's house, you know. So like I honestly thought that's how the world worked, you know? Like yeah. I thought like people didn't snitch on each other and if they did like they would get whooped or stabbed. Like, you know, snitches like, I, get stitches. Yeah, like I thing. literally thought like that's how like life was, you know, like yeah. that's all the the stuff that I had to like get out of my head and completely shut off when I get out. But like, which, and it's kind of crazy that like it helped my sense. I feel like going in so young because I honestly, I say this all the time. Like I didn't know how good life was. You know what I mean? Mm. I didn't, I didn't. I, and if I would have known that this is what life was like, I would have been a lot harder doing 12 years in there. You know, like I went away as a kid and I used to say like, I didn't, I like just go to prison. I was raised in prison. You know, like I, I, I grew up in there and I lived there and I like, didn't think about getting out. Cause I didn't think I was going to get out. And I just thought that's how life was. And I thought my life sucked, but that's how life was. Yeah. You know, before we get to the turn, I've always wanted to ask someone, and I texted you this morning. I was like, can I ask you anything I <laughs> <Yes>. want? <laughs> uh -oh. but yes. I have two questions. One is ratchet. One is a very <laughs> ratchet question. So like, did the guys try to hit on you in prison? My gay followers are going to know this. So, so. it's funny. <laughs> yeah. So if what's crazy is they have like male women in there, right? You'll have some dudes in there with boobs and everything. So they're, they, they call them Cheetos. So transgender. Not down there, but they can have boobs and stuff, right? And so those are the ones I'd have to worry about. Not in a bad way, like they're trying to do anything to me. They would just stalk me. Like I used to have, when I was on like a three yard or something, I would have there, and they'd all run together, you know, like there's clicks and they're just like that. So That's there'd be wild. like a little click of like six, they would call them six chitlins and they'd all run together. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's a derogatory term either, but that's just. Sounds... That's what everybody calls them. Yeah, so I mean, they, they even know that. So I don't think prison it's culture. Yeah, yeah, they but know. But anyways, and, <laughs> and they would just follow me around there. And it was so like, but not in a bad way, not like they were going to do anything. They had, they just had a crush. I mean, they thought I was like the cutest thing on the yard or whatever. So <laughs> I had to do, not even dodge them. I was, I was cool with all them too. You know what I'm saying? But I used to tell them like back up, you know, like when I was younger, I definitely would for sure wear a towel to the shower instead of wearing my little boxers or something yeah, like that. You're like, waiting for you to walk out of the shower, just to watch me. You know I'm like? Oh Jesus. yeah. What's that show? Six, 60 days, in? 60 days in, yeah. 60 days in. So, and I think there was one season where they put all the gay people in a separate pod. Okay. So that's not how it is there? No, 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 oh. not at all. Yeah, and like I said, there's so it's not like raping and stuff that you think you'd have to worry about. It's, it's just like, yeah, they're just normal gay inmates. and that's So like, is it, people know that people are gay. It's not like yeah. as crazy as it sounds. Not at all. They know 100% they're gay, yeah. And they it's, it's so crazy. So they'll have like, like I had youngsters when I was running yards and they will have like a prison daddy. That's what they could literally call them. <laughs> I'm not even joking. So Jesus, take the... <laughs> yeah so whoever that Woo. what's funny is whoever has i need a t-shirt that says prison daddy <laughs> <laughs> 
whoever is that Cheeto's under, she's like the wife. Like she cleans his cell, does his laundry, all that stuff. And that's, but then like he takes care of on the flip side. So yeah, like yeah, yeah. Feeds her her protection, all that stuff. And so it's like, yeah, it works like that. Oh my gosh. All right. That's enough of my ratchet conversation. <laughs> What's the other question? Today? The other question is it's, it's much more serious. Yeah. <laughs> We need humor. Yeah, too. right. I'm with it. Uh, the next question is actually more about the mental health yeah. that goes around the combination of being in prison, trying to survive, trying to, for lack of a better way of saying it, keeping yourself relevant in terms of power. For real. And then leading into solitary confinement because all of those things could scare the shit out of so many people. And then once you get in a solitary confinement, this is, you know, I have <laughs> tattoos, mine says conquer okay. your mind, transform your life. I love that. But a lot of it, I also talk about the soundtrack of your mind. So like, as you're going through this process of protection, trying to make yourself relevant and then going to solitary confinement, like what is going through your head? Like, I just need to know like that process of change. For you know? sure, no, and I, and I love talking about that too because it's what I tell people all the time. Like, I wasn't a mentally strong person when I went to prison and I'm claustrophobic and I got locked in a five by seven for 24 hours a day, you know? And it's not, Arizona don't do 23 hours a day lockdown, it's 24 hours a day lockdown, you know? And you know how small a five by seven is? It's like this, that's touching both walls. Yeah. You do a little bird bath in your, in your toilet and like half your bed's soaking wet because that's how small your cell is. And you spend 24 hours a day there. And I remember the first time I got, I went in there and they locked those huge doors there. And I remember I would have little panic attacks all the time, you know, and I'd be like, where it felt like my heart was going to explode. And I'd be like hyperventilating, like, what, how am I going to do this? You know, but you just do it, you know? So then you start like what worked for me and it's crazy enough is like, I would talk to myself a lot, you know, like literally like, and I would put notes up and I, you know, still do this a little bit, you know, like I would no joke, put a note up. Like, cause when I started getting sent to solitary confinement, I was running stuff, you know, so I like, I wanted to be this big, bad shot call, you know, so I would like put a note on there. Like, you want to be that dude, be the dude, you know, like, or don't be a bitch, excuse my yeah, language, you know, no, I would have to, <laughs> okay, I would have to put notes up. I got all the time. And so like, if, I, if I'd wake up and like, realize I was close over, I hated my life. I'd look at that note, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I, and I would, I was kind of hard on myself too, you know, and I was like, I put myself there, you know, like. Granted, I shouldn't have got 12 years for a burglary charge. If I don't burglarize that house, I don't put it in the judge's hands to give me 12 years. You know what I'm saying? So it's only my fault anyways. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, right. But anyways, going back to mental health, we can all teach ourselves mental health like and mental strength. You know, like now my story is so, I love it so much because like I can talk to people that are struggling and I can tell them like half my story and you can just see like I said enough. I got their attention. You know what I'm saying? You can see this light go off now and it's like, so now my life that was so bad and so horrible. Now I can literally use it to save lives and help people. You know right. what I'm saying? Like realize that they're not, they don't got it that bad, you know, like, and which is why I'm so like, I'm so chill and just like laid back now with like food or anything. I still drink sink water. Like, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? We like, had a conversation we about had that this morning. Like, this morning. Like, cause I told her daughter wants to fight me when I do it. I'm like sink water. I mean, I'm like, I get it, but like, let's not drink sink. Water. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I try to get, he was not on my side with it at all, you I know, wasn't. but that's why I try to tell her daughter sometimes too, because it's like, she's so used to being in control and like having everything going. I was like, stuff goes off kilter sometimes, you know, it's, we're going to figure itself out. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't trip over little stuff, like little stuff's little stuff, you know, and there's so much other stuff to, to trip on. You know, if you really want to get something to trip on, it's like, like, I just try to be like, my number one thing is I just try to be grateful and have gratitude. You know, as long as I have grateful gratitude and perspective is another biggest thing, you know, as long as I can just always remember about like the perspective that my life's in from where it was, like I can, I should never be allowed to feel down for too long. From the minute you walk into prison to obviously getting robbed and things that get you solitary confinement. After you got out of solitary confinement, how much longer did you have in prison? I pretty much stayed in solitary confinement for the most part. And I'd make it out on a yard for a few months, then go right back to solitary confinement. While that situation is not a positive experience, right? That's like to the average person, we're like, that's crazy. Also say a lot of times through struggle comes strength. For sure. Right? And so you gave the example of you used to write on the wall. If you can give me five or four other things that you did mentally to keep yourself strong and to like, in a way, talk about how those things help you make that like curve of change. For one, I would say the biggest thing is that I just wanted to prove people wrong, you know, and I wanted to prove to people that I could make it out of them and still make something of myself. Perspective, just like I said, is a huge thing. So like, and just to show you, like, I have a hard time even talk about this stuff, but like perspective. So I always had to like find someone that had a, that had a worse life than me. Or they had a worse situation than I was dealing with, which is like, 
and during these times, like the only, you know, what's crazy is the only time, the only person I could think of that like literally had like a worse life than mine that had nothing to complain about was like, and I would compare it to women that got sexually assaulted or raped Yeah, because I'm like, they did literally nothing wrong. And you know, what's crazy. I read this book and it's what got me through one of my solitary confinement times is, and I don't remember the girl's name. It was that, that one little girl that got kidnapped for like 15 years out in California. And that dude had her back in the shed of his house. He was like on parole as a convicted sex offender in California. Dugard. Yes. Dugard. Yes, I, yes, I yes. kid you not. This is the exact time that when they told my mom I was in solitary confinement, they told her I had to sell one of my cells. So they like came in. I'm in a solitary confinement cell. And not only that, they come take all my property out of my solitary confinement cell, like leave me in there with nothing but a mattress, right? And I'm like, but I had, the, but I had my book. So I'm, and I'm reading this book. Thank God I had that book today because I'm like, she was like handcuffed her. And I would like literally, I would visualize that being me, you know? And I'm like, I'm in the cell and I can, and I would look at like, I could walk back and forth. It's eight feet, but whatever it is, I could walk. I had my arms. And then I'd read it. She was like handcuffed and like, he would like handcuff her and just like lay her on her stomach. So she was probably stuck there for a day. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, yeah. and I would like, when you've been handcuffed, you can like put that into perspective too. So I know what the handcuffs do to your shoulders. And I'm like thinking this poor little girl, like her shoulders were probably killing her the next day. You know And I'm like thinking like, and I would just tell myself how selfish is it of me to like bitch about my situation when I put myself here, you know what I'm saying? When there's little girls like that, that are in 50 times worse situation than us and she did nothing wrong, you know? So perspective, and that's why I say perspective is a huge thing in life. Now, my number one thing is just proving people wrong, man. You know, like when someone tells me I can't do something, like I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? Like I used to go around to CEOs in prison. I would ask them like, how, no joke. I would be like, how long do you think I'm going to stay out of prison? Everybody would say like, uh, two weeks six months, three months, a month, you know? And like, I never got one corrections officer that ever said I would like make it out of prison and stay out here, you know? And, but I remember that stuff, you know? And I, I kept that in my head for when I got out, you know? And when times got tough, you know, I'm like, don't not, do not break, you know what I mean? And like talking to myself a ton, just like about not breaking, you know what I'm saying? Not giving up, you know? Cause like, I look at homeless dudes now on Ray Road, you know, like there's a, there's, there's a street from my house and there's always a homeless dude there, you know? And people are like, how could someone be homeless? And I'm like, I was, I was one more thing probably away from like my mom and dad giving up on me to make me homeless. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, luckily my family forgave me enough times, but <clears throat> it was all God's plan to get me here to this situation. You know what I'm saying? That's why I got 12 years in prison for my thing. Cause I am a tough dude and I can handle it. Now I can like use that to be an example. That's why like when I overdosed, and I got out of prison. God saved my life from dying. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I'm the only case that survived in that condition because I've God saved me to do this mission that I'm on now. Let's talk about the exit of prison like the the feeling and then you know i always tell people run through the finish line yeah. because i think a lot of those ceos probably say oh you're only gonna make it out two weeks because most people think that you exiting prison that moment is like the best that's that's the moment but the moment really happens after yep so talk about that transition like what that was like yeah there was one moment in the video that i watched on youtube where you went to the store and you were like it was a candy you're like yeah. there's so much 37 dollars so in candy and energy drinks <laughs> yeah i yeah. thought that was like pretty funny because i'm like i would have been the same i way. still have i used to have i used to cry going to the grocery store i'm not even joking i would cry i was like i can't get there's too many decisions here i can't and mm. i'm still like this you know like yeah yeah so what's crazy is solitary confinement saved my life at the very end so my last, I'm just under a year to the gate, which means I'm just under a year to go home. My youngsters go, they go to kill this dude. Like, no joke. Like, slice his throat ear to ear. Snap. When you say your youngsters, these are the people that... They're just my youngsters on the your yard. Your guys. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. yeah every, every shot goal and every dude running the yard has youngsters there on the yard, you know? And, um, dude, they... I mean, I'm not joking. Like, I'm not trying to be too graphic, but, like, stab this dude's eyeballs out, slit his throat, like... The worst of the worst stuff you could ever imagine. And I still hear this dude's voice screaming in my head to this day, which is um, a lot. Yeah, a lot. But I went to solitary confinement that time, <clears throat> and I was still just on the yard politics. You know, I was on drugs. You know, I weighed 180. So drugs in, in prison? Dr were even worse in prison. <clears throat> I got worse on drugs in prison than I even was out on the streets because I never saw a needle of someone injecting drugs. I'd never seen heroin or anything. And like heroin is what everybody does in prison. So yeah, my drug habit got worse. So I, and I got involved in heroin in there. So I'm 180 pounds, just under a year to the gate, go to investigate for this attempted murder. And they get me for calling the shot on this guy. I wasn't involved, but I was for calling the shot on the guy. And it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because like, after I got over the, like the, I'm in the hole again, I'm probably going to go home from here. And then I'm like, this might be the only place that I can actually get my mind right because you can't get your mind right on the yard, especially not when you run in your yard, you know? And I was just like, I sat in that hole for those 10, 11 months and I ended up getting out of prison weighing 260 pounds. But keep in mind, I got my yard off the politics and stuff. I still have no idea what I'm going to do when I get out, but I've just told myself I'll figure it out. I just got to make it out of prison and I'll figure it out, you know? But like, 
I always say this, like the epitome of success in my story, like no joke, what I shot for, like if I was like, if I could say I made it when I got out of prison, what, I, what would have happened is I would have somehow got sober, but probably had some boring ass life and probably did like construction, make a minimum wage or something like that, but at least had a job. And that was like literally like the peak of success. That was the top. Yeah. That's what I shot for, which is why when I started making so much money, I, I quit my job because I was like, how selfish is it, is it of me to know that we can do this when we get out of prison? But no one tells these inmates that, you know what I'm saying? So I literally walked, I'm out, I mean, I walked away from a $350,000 a year job for four and a half years out of prison. So what did you do? I was a finance manager at a car dealership in Scottsdale, Marquia. Shout out to Marquia. <laughs> <laughs> the only guy that ever hired me. Oh man, I got more questions. All right, so <laughs> let's, let's talk about family post prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I did watch the reunion, which I thought was like really, really, really powerful, especially being a dad. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a dad of five-year-old twins. And they're, you know, even when you tell your story in the beginning and actually hearing your dad and you, I think it was your first podcast where your dad was like, I remember the day you were born. I was like, gosh, it's the, I'll get the chills. Like, I, it's like, I like knowing the day my kids were born and, and our whole thing is to protect them. Right. Yep. But they're going to have their own life. So after you got out, like, how was like the reconnection with your family, even though your mom was your ride or die, probably throughout the entire process. My mom doesn't even count because she's like me. Like we're like, just like this always, no matter what, like my dad, like I feel like had to like relearn me as a person. And like, <clears throat> we're still dealing with it right now, you know, because yeah. my dad's problem is I feel like I was always like, not always, but I was like a screw up for a lot of times. You know what I mean? And like, he was able to berate me and talk down to me because, and I, it was acceptable because I, I needed it. You know, I needed advice from somebody. And now it's like, I'm not that dude anymore. And he, but he still has that image in his head that like he can talk to me like that or whatever. So like, we're still like learning each other. I feel like a lot of times, you know, like luckily, like I talked to a sponsor that's like in my recovery sponsor, but just for life advice, you know what I'm saying? Because like one thing about the streets is you can get advice from anybody out here. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not alone. I'm not locked in a cell where I have to figure everything out on my own. Like I know sometimes my head doesn't give me the right decisions. I talk to her a lot of times about relationship stuff because like, I don't know, like <clears throat> I just don't know. And the worst thing you can do is just like, try to like think you have to tackle this all on your own. And like, you have a phone that you can get any answer from in the world. Like I always say this now, I'm not smart, but I have a phone with a ton of dudes that are smart on my phone. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And I've, and I hustle and they do all the rest for me. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's literally what I say. So yeah, me and my dad are still kind of, you know, learning each other and learning how to like balance it and stuff. And I had this, you know, the, a crazy, little thing that my sponsor told me is like, cause I used to call my dad, you know, every day or sometimes twice a day, but it was still from prison. You know, like I was like, I get to make phone calls now. So I was like, I don't even think he's like, maybe you're talking to your dad too much. I was like, never thought about it like that. I just thought I could make phone calls now. So I would just call my dad, you know, and that's like worked a ton. So instead of talking every day or twice a day, you know, we talk once or twice a week now and it's like so much better now because then it's like, you just get to fill in on each other's yeah, lives. Instead of, yeah, yeah. And it's instead it's like, we're doing something. My dad's ride mask about like what I did on my Instagram story yesterday or something like that. And we'll <laughs> fight about that. I'm like, nah, you know how to run Instagram dad, you know? <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, you know, but like I said, it's, I, I get advice from people. I talk to a therapist. I, you know, I it just, the greatest thing about being out here is that you can ask for help and get help in anything. I love that so much. Let's talk about the drug addiction. And I know you talked about, can I just ask you, how the hell do they get drugs in prison? I've seen TV shows, I've seen documentaries, but I want to hear from somebody that was <laughs> in there because I'm like, how does stuff still get in? The one quick, simple answer is visitation. So if I have a girl that's she can bring in visitation and they put it up there, keister it and bring it on back just like that. I was in a, you're much for this one, but I was in a, little mini relationship with a corrections officer so she was bringing it into me every week like they wrap it up just like you see like thrown it over with cars and like little like quarter rolls and stuff and they're bringing like that cell phones we had promethazine with syrup in there like that and that was a four yard which is like literally one step below maximum security and we're drinking promethazine with syrup like smoking blunts in our cells but the ceos smell it somewhat so a lot of, here's the other thing too when you're on four yards a lot of times those cops they know like murders happen there like a four yards is the real deal like people get killed on four yards so like those cops a lot of times they just want to go home you know what i'm saying so they'll literally turn their eye to stuff because they don't want that they're like i got kids home like yeah i mean this dude yeah because yeah here's the deal because some dude that's doing 20 years or something like that if you're gonna try and take his rig away or something like that or if they rather, got life yeah like, he don't he don't care he'd rather just smash you than take that's the same ticket anyways either way he ain't going home i hated it at first because i was just like i felt like completely out of place but that's the end of my sentence like i didn't like doing time on low security yards i like the high security yards where the cops wouldn't mess with us and like they were cops were scared walking the yards and like i fed off that stuff you know what i mean it's like 
but it's such a stupid like facade and image you know and I'm like and that's what it just made me more institutionalized and made more sh- more stuff i had to completely reverse engineer in my own brain when i got out you yeah, know what i mean exactly so then so you get out of prison how did the how did you overcome the addiction so this it's kind of a crazy story so i'm i get out i remember i'm 30 years old now i've never had a job never been on a date never seen a flat screen tv never none of that stuff I wanted to drink, of course, and party like all my friends had been doing for all those years and stuff. And the trouble I had with recovery was like, hey, I didn't see myself as an alcoholic. You know what I mean? Because I was like, I've never drank. Like, I never drank by myself. I'm a closet drinker. Like, I like to go out and party. The problem with me is like, I realized that, and I learned this the hard way, is when I drink, I don't have an off button. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm blacked out and someone has drugs on me, I might do drugs, you know? And so that happened to me. I had... It was probably eight months after I was home. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I was just sitting at the bar. We were doing shots where it was a buddy's birthday party. It was literally the afternoon time. I remember the sun was still out. The last thing I remember is doing a shot of rumplements. And bam, next thing you know, I wake up in the ambulance. And I'm like, I remember I come to and I was just like, what the heck? And I asked the paramedic, I was like, what am I doing in here? And he's like, you overdose. I was like, I don't even use drugs anymore. He's like, well, you did today. And I was like, what the hell happened, you know? And I remember driving the hospital. I was like kind of in and out of consciousness. And I was like thinking, for one, how what an idiot I am, you know? And like, if I just did really do drugs, why couldn't I have just overdose and died and not been here anymore, you know? Mm. And I finally get to the hospital. My heart was only beating six beats a minute by the time they got me to the hospital. When they found me, I had no heartbeat. I was dead, like full-blown dead. They brought me back, gave me a ton of Narcan. And, and next thing you know, I hear my little brother in the hallway, like talking to my dad, who lives in South Dakota. And it's the only one I'm like still scared of a little bit, you know? So of course me, this 30 year old shot call. Now I'm like, why are you on the phone with dad? You know? And he's like, do you not know what happened? I was like, I have no idea what happened today. That's finally when the doctor came in and told me that my heart was beating six beats a minute. They were dead when they found me. And he's like, you're lucky to be alive. He's like, I've never seen someone survive in this condition. And I was like, what the heck? And then what's crazy enough is I had survivor's remorse after that. Mm. I remember laying there thinking like, for one, mad that I survived. Cause I just wanted the fighting to be over. You know what I'm saying? Like I was done. Like I, I would never kill myself only be, literally only because of my mom and my little brother, mm. but I was done fighting. So I like, I looked at like that, that could have been easy out for me. You know what I'm saying? I didn't kill myself, but at least I was gone. I was done fighting. You know, what's crazy is how I've found, and this is what like made me find God again is my ex-girlfriend's little sister found me and I didn't find this out till afterwards, but she went to go tanning after work, she said she pulled up to the tanning bed salon, parked her car, got out of, got out of her car like normal. She walked up to the tanning bed salon door and she said, once she put her hand on the door handle, she said something told her to go home. She takes her hand off the handle, gets in her car, and goes back home. She's the one that finds her with no heartbeat. I mean, if she walks in there and takes another two seconds, I'm probably gone. Like, you can't stay too long without a heartbeat. So I find this out afterwards, and, she, and she's the one that finds her. I was, like, thinking, damn, I, was, I got saved by something there, you know? And I was, like, thinking, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm done making excuses. I'm done looking at the differences in people, and I'm going to start looking at the similarities when, when it can help me because that's the biggest thing that I always tell people that are in recovery. Now it's like, don't look at the differences of people. Like look at the similarities, you know, cause that's a lot of people don't want to go to meetings because like it's a bunch of old white dudes in those meetings. Now I'm like, close your, I tell them, close your eyes and just listen to what they say. You know what I'm saying? You won't know what color they are and it'll see, it'll sound like the same stuff that's in your mind. And I was just like, I'm just done making shoes. I'm going to actually like put effort in there and, st- and stop saying that I can't amount to anything because that's, that was my dad. Was like you get a job. I'm like, who the hell is going to hire me, dad? You know what I mean? Who's going to hire me? And I decided to like finally like just quit drinking and get sober. And that was, you know, it's crazy. That would have been my brother's birthday weekend. So that was 2016. And my brother's, my brother's birthday is July 29th. And my sobriety date is July 30th, 2016. So I decided just to quit drinking and gave up on all that. And I was like, I'm going to actually like stop making excuses, do the stuff that I should be doing that I said that I couldn't do. And I went, I actually got a job selling cars at Marquia and then, you know, made 10 grand my second month ever working and the rest is history. I mean, the rest is current because you're still able to tell the story. What is your definition of trust and belief? Wow, that's a good question. The reason that I felt like I was able to, I'm able to make it so far in life and still is confidence. You know, like I, I, mean, I always say this, I, I probably toe the line of cocky and confident, you know what I'm saying? But I always <laughs> say this, I'd rather err on the, being too cocky than like not having self-confidence because if you don't have self-confidence, you're not, you're not going to do anything, you know? And like, and here's the greatest thing about now is like, I used to look at myself in the mirror and like, and I was seriously, I remember Sean in this little scraped up mirrors in prison. I would look at that thing. And I remember thinking like, thank God I can't like totally see myself in that mirror, you know? 
And I just, I would look at that mirror and be like, what a loser, you know, like what a full blown loser you are. And now like I get to look at myself and like, I'm, I'm finally like happy of myself, you know, like the second I started putting other people first and putting me second, like the blessings that happened to me, like I, they're just indescribable, you know, like, and I can finally like go show my mom, like be happy to see my mom, you know, like literally as cliche as it sounds, like I said, be when I wake up, when I go look in the mirror, like I'm literally proud of the person I am. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. when I wake up early in the morning, I'm like proud that I got up early in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it doesn't stop. And the second I like let off the pedal, like someone's going to pass me, you know? And I'm like, and I, someone gave me a great analogy the other day. And they said, cause like, he was trying to like find out how like I had such success so fast when I got out of prison and it was perfect. And it made perfect sense. He's like, you had to like, say, we're all here. Like success is right here. I started from like way down here, you know, like most people could you start right here or something like that. He goes, you had to fight so hard to become successful from the jump that like once I fought and got back up to even level with everybody, like I don't just shut that off. You know what I'm saying? So what do I do, I just, I keep going with the motor that I have and I, and I go past it because like, and here's another great thing that people should always also think is like why I'm able to go so far as you have 24 hours in a day. I literally look at it like I can do anything I want every single day because I have the freedom to do that. And if like, but it's all about perspective because I've not had the freedom to do whatever I wanted every day, you know? So like, and other people should look at that. Like we live in the greatest place ever, like in this country, you get to literally do whatever you want every yeah. single day, you know? And most people don't have enough gratitude to realize that, you know, and they're, they're too stuck on like the pity party, like thinking that they, Oh, someone wronged them last week or something like that. I can't do this. or this dude has the job I want or something like that. And it's like, this is literally America. You can do anything you want. And the other thing I always say is like, people will be so dissatisfied with their life and so unhappy, but choose to wake up and do the exact same thing every single day. Very true. You know what I'm saying? Like make a change, do something different. If you don't like your job, go start and find another job. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Like if you're, if you're 40 years old, I didn't have my first job till I was 31 years old. I worked for five years. I was trying to figure out, not figure you out when we started, you know, connecting. It was just more of like, it's like, I felt something. You know, and I think you are literally the walking definition of grateful. Because, you know, like I would even ask myself, you know, I'm, I know I'm Sean T. Like, I know, you know, I have this like platform, but I'm like, this guy's like mad cool. Why is he like, why is he kicking it with me? Everybody sees themselves differently, you know, but like on the outside and like looking at you, I'm like, oh, like I get his connection to the world. And I'm not in, and what's crazy is like at first I I, would, I wanted to like just help people that were in prison and addicts out and all that stuff and it's like i'm past that now like that's my biggest thing with like with her daughters i'm trying to like just have gratitude and little stuff like let little stuff go like you don't have to be in control everything like stuff's all going to figure itself out and like god's in control anyways you know what i'm saying like what i choose to do after this is i'm choosing but god's doing it for me anyways you know what i'm saying like we all just got to let stuff go and just like be grateful like gratitude any any youngster i'm dealing with that's like new in recovery that's the number one thing that i always tell them like gratitude number one and perspective is number two you know what i'm saying never forget where you come from because that's the biggest disservice i can do to myself not only myself but the rest of the world is like forget where i came from because i have a message now and i'm here to like help people and i'm not it's not only like i'm not trying to help ex inmates and stuff like that. i'm trying to help people like you that you think that you you think you can't change stuff or you don't think you got it this great and it's like bro look at your look at your life. You know what I'm saying? Like I walked in, I was like, Jesus, Shanti is living it up. <laughs> Jesus. But it well, gives me goal. No. And that's what yeah. it's about. Because then I look at that house because I have confidence and I know what my motor can do. And I know that I can do anything I want every day. I seriously walked in this house and I looked at your front walk, whatever the heck you call that thing is. <laughs> and I'm like, instead of being like bitter, like I used to be and like thinking this dude's got it all or something like that. I'm like thinking, damn, I cannot wait to build a house like this. First of all, thank you. But I can't wait to come on your podcast yes. as well. Yes. Because you know, the evolution of change is where I know for a fact that we, you know, everybody has a story and I can't wait to share mine. It'll be awesome too. Cause my, mine just went live last week. And I think it's a probably about a million tablets in prisons across the whole country. And your little, uh, insanity stuff was pretty popular there in prisons on late nights. That's how distorted your mind gets. So everybody in there'll be watching that insanity in the middle of the night in there too. So that's how I knew who you're from. Now I know I'm a popular <laughs> gay. Ah! No, I'm kidding. You know, I will tell you. That's a, the truth, though. I'll tell you a really funny story. Um, I actually visited a prison once. Actually, it was a, it was a county okay. jail. Yeah. And because this, there was this woman who did, like, forensics. And so I went to visit that. And then her boyfriend was somehow connected to the county jail. And so I went through there. And so I'm walking. The inmates was, would look at me. And they'd be like, yo. And then, like, a couple of them would start doing my hip-hop yeah. abs thing. I just met another guy in my gym who was in prison for 10 years and he was in solitary confinement and he said your workouts is kind of what got me through 
And he was like, the commercial would come on. He was like, I would just do those exercises. And then like when the next scene came on, he's like, and then I started memorizing exercises, yeah. worked out. So I was just like, that's pretty cool. And what's crazy, just and this might be something little too, but just to show people like what's possible is like it, to put this into perspective, you know, 10 years ago, I was watching your insanity videos. And I remember watching when you came out with the hip hop apps and I was like, this dude can't stop, right? Like this dude is just <laughs> printing money, right? <laughs> But seriously, and it's like, I see that stuff. And now it's like, I'm literally at your beautiful home, like doing your podcast. You know what I'm saying? Like, what are the chances that would happen? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it happens. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Miracles happen if you just continue to do the work and put other people first, and then God's going to keep blessing on the backside. It also happens with your determination, power, and perseverance. Which everybody has. I just choose to do it a lot more than other people. We exactly. all have this inside us, too. You know what I'm saying? I was not, I was not born to nothing special. And, and to be honest, I thought I was ripped off. Seriously, I used to think I was ripped off and shorted by God. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But when I realized that it's not, I just started focusing on the stuff that I'm good at. Because here's the deal. I'm not smart. I got a lot of street smarts. There's a lot of people that are way smarter than me. They don't have street smarts. Like, we all have certain characteristics that we were born better than others with. You know what I'm saying? It's all about finding what you are truly gifted at from God and then just honing in on that. I mean, I, I do want to challenge you for a second. Yeah. I would stop saying you're not smart. <laughs> Because there are, a lot saying of, that there are a lot of people that can look at books and they're really intelligent at memorizing things that are really good at science that are really good at math. And they're just not good at self-reflection or being able to like be present with themselves. Yeah. So you are smart just in a different area I appreciate of life. That. Yeah, for trust sure. and believe in that. Yeah, trust and believe. Guys, thank you for listening. Peter, thank you for coming here. This will not be the last time you see him on a show because no. I, I know for a fact that there is much more internally. However... Keep it here on my podcast and make sure you follow both of us on social media so that you can see when I'm a guest on his podcast. Tell him how to find you. Yeah. Um, Instagram is just Peter underscore Meyerhoff. And that's M-E-Y-E-R-H-O-F-F. Website is just that PeterMeyerhoff.com. TikTok's that. Podcast is Roll Call with Chappie. That's four different words. Um, check it out and listen to episode one. It's my full uncut story. And go to YouTube too. Yeah, YouTube too, please. Run up the YouTube. Because, you know, as a he's, a he's good to look at. They thought he was cute when he went to prison. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, check out my YouTube. You get to see it in person. <laughs> exactly. Get into it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you it. for having me. For sure. This is a pleasure. <laughs>